everyone. Hi again, and welcome to another session of Endometriosis Awareness. So the, there is a famous quote by a Greek physician called Hippocrates, food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. This has stood the test of time. Of late, we keep hearing as many people talking about anti-inflammatory diets. But what exactly is inflammation? So inflammation refers to your body's process of fighting against things that harm it, like infections, injuries, or any toxin. It's an attempt to heal itself. So when something damages your cells, your body releases chemicals that trigger a response from your immune system. So inflammation can be good or bad. So acute inflammation that happens in your body is a good type of inflammation, and it's a, bod it's a normal body response. But something, when it becomes chronic, is a bad type of inflammation. And it happens if the inflammatory process goes on for a very long time. Or if there is too much of inflammation. Chronic inflammation can lead to a numerous health issues like arthritis, IBS, asthma, peptic ulcers, heart diseases, and endometriosis. So, as we all know, endometriosis is a very common disease which happens to one in 10 women. We have been talking over it again and again that it needs to be, you know, people have to be aware of what exactly it is. So first and foremost, our guest for today is Amita Gadre, who is a leading clinical nutritionist in Pune and is the founder of Amita Gadre's Holistic Nutrition. He's behind some of the most effective health and fitness transformations for over last 10 years. Her experience in clinical nutrition with hundreds of patients has led her to her firm belief in what we have just said, let food die, be thy medicine. Amita provides life-ready nutrition solutions that takes your life, routine, and your own individual needs into account, putting on track long-term health and fitness. Her diet consulting is based on the principle that all food, foods are good and can be eaten by everyone. It's vital to understand how each food functions in the body in order to optimize its nutritive value and hence achieve better health. Thanks to her global online nutritional counseling practice, she has been featured in a lot of publications like Times of India, India Today, and Pune in Mumbai Mirror. Mumbai Mirror. So hi, Amita. I'm so glad to have you here with us. Hi, hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you for having me here. And before we start, congratulations to you. Dr. Shilpa and Dr. Vimi for doing this amazing work of spreading awareness about endometriosis. It is the need of the day. And thank you for having me here. Thank you so much, Amita. Thank and you for joining and us. With us. And with us, we have again Dr. Vimi Bindra. Uh, I think everyone knows her by now. Introduction is just a formality now. <laughs> So, so Dr. Vimi is a renowned gynecologist and laparoscopic surgeon at Apollo Hospitals Hyderabad. She specializes in fertility enhancing surgeries and endometriosis excision surgeries. She has a vast experience in different types of laparoscopic and hysteroscopy surgeries. She's been working incessantly to improve the quality of life with women in, with endometriosis. So Vimi, hi again. Hi, it's, Shilpa. It's always a pleasure having this conversation with you. And uh, I think all of you know Shilpa also by now. She <laughs> is a dentist by profession and now she's working very hard towards raising awareness for endometriosis and she has become a patient advocate as well. So yeah. uh, she's working day and night and uh, trying to bring in new and new sessions for all of you guys so that we can spread more awareness and help more women fighting with endometriosis, get them the proper treatment and quality of care in time. Thank you, Shilpa. Absolutely. Thank you so much. For what thank, you. thank you. So as Vimi said, I'm an endometriosis survivor and I've been fighting for it, fighting to increase the awareness about this, this disease, which affects one in 10 women worldwide. And still people don't know about it. When you talk about endometriosis, people are so lost. So Vimi, we'll come to you uh, first. So as we all know, endometriosis is an estrogen dependent, multifaceted gynecological condition that frequently causes chronic and cyclic pelvic pain, and frequently considered as an inflammatory disease. In most cases, the pain is due to an invasion of endometrial, endometrial cells and pro-inflammatory mediators on the nerve fibers. So can you just help me with 
uh, what exactly happens in endometriosis and how does diet help in patients with endometriosis? So, Shifa, endometriosis is a condition where uh, lining, the tissue similar to the lining of the uterus is also implanted outside the uterus. It can be at any part of the body other than a spleen. And most common location is the pelvis and ovaries. So it affects those areas. And as you already said, it's an inflammatory disorder. This tissue produces its own estrogen and other hormones. And it keeps growing and invading into the tissues. So it involves the uh, inflammatory process, which starts adhering to the adjacent tissue. Like if ovary has a cyst, and ovarian surface gets adhered to the posterior surface of the uterus, to the tubes, the peritoneum gets affected, the bowel gets affected, the ureter gets affected. These are the most common organs which are getting affected with these things. And patients yes. usually have painful periods. They have fatigue. They have depression. They have infertility issues, right. painful purification, painful urination. Not everyone will have all the symptoms, but it is a spectrum of symptoms which we may encounter with endometriosis in different patients. And yes, in some patients, it may be a silent disease and they are detected only when they come for infertility evaluation. Okay. Now, okay. now if we uh, talk about uh, diet for uh, prevention of endometriosis, see endometriosis is a genetic disease. So I would not say that if you take certain kind of diet, you can completely prevent it. But this is also true that it causes a lot of inflammation. So if we eat the right kind of food, a lot of inflammation and the inflammatory symptoms can be reduced to a certain extent. Okay. And there have been various studies where they have found association retrospectively, the patient who had endometriosis were not taking enough of certain vitamins and certain minerals. So there are studies which have proven some association. But yes, we cannot say that this diet or certain kind of food will definitely prevent or cure your endometriosis. The treatment okay. for endometriosis remains surgical, but surgery is only one part of it. So it's a multidisciplinary approach when we talk about endometriosis management. It needs diet changes, lifestyle changes, pelvic exercises, surgical excision, and even psychological counseling also. So some of the studies have also shown that fruits and vegetables like fish oils, dairy products rich in calcium and vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids, they are likely connected with a lower risk of developing endometriosis. But yes, the association is not proven. Risk factors which increase the risk of endometriosis include the consumption of products which are rich in trans unsaturated fatty acids or consumption of fats or red meat, such as consumption of beef and alcohol. So definitely these kind of foods increase the inflammation and the symptoms of the patients. But there is no clear correlation between particular food pressure or food type and the risk of endometriosis. But in our clinical practice, we have seen that uh, patients of endometriosis do well when we put them on anti-inflammatory diet. When they change their little bit of dietary habits, they reduce spices and use less oils, reduce red meat, smoking, alcohol, definitely it increases their quality of life. Perfect. Uh, I think that makes real sense. Uh, so, Amita, uh, this question would go to you. Uh, Vimi did cover a certain aspect of how endometriosis health, uh, the diet helps in endometriosis. But I wanted to know from you, you being a clinical nutritionist. So does diet, diet affect endometriosis? I mean, actually, does it affect and how does it affect? Oh, yes, it does. So like uh, Dr. Vimi already mentioned that um, you know, like say eating a certain kind of diet is not going to cure you of it but what we do is you know manage the symptoms so it actually helps you to reduce the pain decrease the inflammation and plus whatever uh, like you know uh, painkillers and everything that you are taking to manage the all the uh, pelvic pain and other pains that you are facing in endometriosis it definitely helps you improve you know like say what is the drug efficacy and uh, helps you to manage uh, what is 
like largely an inflammatory disease and uh, bring down the level of inflammation. Um, so like uh, Dr. Vimy mentioned again, like um, alcohol, stress, I'm glad she mentioned, you know, like say psychological as well. So uh, it's uh, endometriosis, just like PCOS is a, a very much a disease where you see a huge uh, mind body connect where, you know, unless and until you're managing your stress levels, your sleep, the alcohol, the caffeine intake, plus your standard, uh, you know, balanced diet, um, it becomes very difficult to handle, you know, like and manage the symptoms. So a good balanced diet. And if your symptoms are like, you know, uh, like, you know, depending on which end of the spectrum you are, um, if you have a lot of uh, pain and a lot of, you know, like say, uh, problems with your periods and everything because of endometriosis, then even like more dietary intervention is required where one can move uh, the patient to say a gluten-free diet or a casein-free diet or a low FODMAP diet and so on and so forth. There are many uh, nutritional therapies and interventions possible uh, where endometriosis is concerned. Perfect. Thanks, Amita. So Amita, you have already mentioned what should be avoided, but in particular, can you name some foods which should be avoided by endometriosis patients for our viewers? Uh, before I would go to foods that you should be just avoiding, like we already know the basics of, you know, like say alcohol or um, caffeine intake or, uh, you know, some green teas as well. Like you have to be very careful of what you're drinking. Um, these are the ones which you want to avoid categorically. But before we move to like say just things that you need to avoid, um, I think it's more important that everyone sets their primary nutritional discipline right. You know, like say um, you are not going to be able to see a result in terms of your medication unless and until you are eating, let's like, say, a balanced meal in terms of your proteins. You are eating the good fats. You need to be eating, like say, a lot of um, fruits and vegetables in your diet because they also come with, uh, you know, like say, the colorful foods, which is the uh, vegetables and berries and everything, they come with a lot of uh, antioxidants. So uh, those foods, you definitely have to uh, ensure that they're, they're in your diet. And um, going to back to foods that you want to avoid is going to be um, definitely the al uh, alcohol on smoking and caffeine and um, you know, uh, foods that are highly processed, sugars, again, because they are known to increase inflammatory levels in the body. Any foods uh, which have, um, say, MSG added to it or high fructose corn syrup, you know, like which is present in juices and beverages are to be completely avoided. Okay. Um, so I, I think uh, you and, also uh, have... Sorry, just to also, also add to it, like even a red meats, like say uh, rich meats, would be awarded. So typically as a nutritional therapy, when a patient comes to me, I um, actually just tell them to go to a more plant-based diet because it has been proven over and over again that uh, eating meat is uh, not really beneficial. Although um, not like lean meat is not, you don't see like a lot of correlation, but still um, overall it improves your gut health because the way the microbiome is handled also you know, changes your response to the inflammatory disease and hence a plant-based diet. All right. And that completely makes sense. Uh, there was another thing which, uh, you know, keeps coming up again and again and something which is very, very confusing for most of the people. Dairy. How good or bad is dairy? You know, because there are confusing statements which keep coming up all the time. So I think this is something which people will be interested about. <laughs> For sure. So uh, when I say plant-based, I also mean that you need to avoid dairy because okay. dairy is again of animal origin and uh, you have to go completely vegan uh, at times, even gluten-free because uh, what is like, say, uh, like say for any inflammatory disease, um, if you again and again, I would repeat that it depends on which end of the spectrum you're on. But a low FODMAP diet, a diet which is gut health friendly, a diet which is dairy free, gluten free, like, you know, has been shown uh, to have a good impact on your, you know, symptom management and on your pain management. So, uh, and again, most dairy products, except um, say some hard cheeses, are very high in FODMAPs, which are like some short, uh, uh, like, you know, short carb, short in carbohydrates, which are not very easily well digested by our uh, gut, like by our intestines. And when those are not uh, digested well, it impacts your gut microbiome. 
uh, and causes like say uh, an imbalance in the gut bacteria hence increasing your, your inflammatory levels so no dairy okay <laughs> so no dairy at all <laughs> yeah uh, amita you did mention about uh, gluten free diet so can you tell us tell our viewers what is gluten free diet and how does it help in endometriosis sure so um gluten is a protein which is uh, which causes you know gives dough uh, like a wheat it's a uh, stretchy nature um so if you look at maida for example which is all purpose flour and uh, anything that you are making with uh, uh, all purpose flour or you know refined flour or maida is going to be really stretchy a uh, similar uh, gluten is also uh, present in what is your atta or your whole wheat um, atta so wheat contains gluten it's a kind of a protein which gives uh, it uh, gives the dough its elasticity now uh, some people uh, are not able to tolerate or rather have a, a like say a frank intolerance to gluten okay now it has been seen that um, uh, levels like gluten levels in the diet are largely uh, correlated or you know have uh, say um, uh, an ill effect on all inflammatory diseases so it uh, okay. because uh, the body's uh, like your gut sensitivity to certain you know like say um, products like gluten or casein is much higher and it brings about an imbalance in your you know like say in the gut health and in say the way your in your digestion so um, that is why gluten is avoided and a gluten free diet will be any diet which does not have any form of wheat so you have to avoid uh, rotis breads uh, pasta noodle um, you know like say um, any baked goods or anything which is made from wheat um, also some uh, oats uh, are unless until they are from a certified gluten free uh, um, factory oats are also best avoided because a lot of times you find like a place that oat, oats are processed you it's also a place where wheat is processed so that cross contamination can lead to you know like say um your uh, it's it's literally like an allergic response that your body gives to gluten uh, especially when you have uh, an inflammatory disease like a chronic inflammatory disease so a diet which is going to completely avoid um, uh, like say wheat so in you can replace wheat with rice you can use uh, you know like spelt you can use amaranth you can use uh, almond meal if you want to you know bake or something or even the indian millets like say the um, uh, jowar rajgira banyard millet fox and millet all of these they none of them have gluten in them even ragi for example ragi is a great um substitute and it's also you know like say anti inflammatory in nature all of these millets so those are great substitutes uh, for a gluten free diet uh that uh, that was like really helpful because uh for me uh if i could i can say uh i have shifted quite a bit to ragi which mm -hmm. has indeed helped me with i mean i being uh, an endometriosis patient myself and i do have a lot of so called endo belly which you know which is caused because of the uh, bloating so yes. for me uh, ragi has surely helped like tremendously i mean i can't uh, you know start counting on how my how many symptoms has it taken care of yeah. so and yeah. the gluten i'm sure it is something which sticks to your intestine and it is like terrible to digest so yeah. guys please be aware of wheat <laughs> i know it's not easy to get rid of uh, the usual roti it will just take a little time but i think we do have substitutes which are available so, so amita just to um, if i may add to that now millets yeah. also are rich in magnesium and zinc um Correct. now magnesium and zinc as a mineral they have been uh, very effectively used in treatment of symptoms and uh, you know like management of um, say digest digestive issues or inflammation in um, endometriosis pcos arthritis all of these so um, another reason why it makes sense to move to millets is also because like while they don't have uh, gluten they are also rich in uh, minerals which you really need to you yeah, know manage the pain correct that makes sense that completely is like the go to uh, kind of a food that you've told yeah. so uh, the new thing that has uh, that has actually caught interest is fodmap diet so can you just tell us a little about what fodmap diet is and how does it help in endometriosis sure so um fodmaps as a diet is began for treatment of ibs which is 
irritable bowel syndrome and also like the people who had um, gluten intolerance like celiac disease or leaky gut and all of those but primarily uh, where ibs was being studied they found that the short chain uh, carbohydrates that are present in some foods um they are not very well tolerated by the uh, gut uh, human gut and uh, that is what creates an imbalance and you know like so you would see symptoms like uh, say burps and indigestion and uh, you know like say um uh, tummy pains and inability to digest and everything um now mm. oh, as studies progressed on the low fat map diet it was found that like what happened happens in ibs again is that your inflammatory levels are very high um because it's like say um it irritates your gut and it hence causes like say an inflammation levels to go high so when they used um the low fodmap diet on like say other patients as well they found that the um diet uh, like say that the um inflammatory levels go down so what are the foods which are really high in uh, fodmaps uh, like say so the, this particular um short chain carbohydrate um so uh, these are things like um, onions garlic leek um or even uh, you know like say your uh, mushrooms and everything need to be avoided then you have uh, sugar snap peas and legumes and pulses and uh, you know like beets so these are very commonly occurring kind of foods uh, but or even wheat dairy so these are like i mentioned dairy is again very high in fat maps so avoiding or switching to a low fat map diet um helps in you know like say bringing down the inflammatory levels because uh like what it is doing at the end of the day is a low fat map diet is building and improving your gut health the gut microbiome that i am constantly talking about um it's literally like you know another brain in your system the uh, you know like say it's it's uh, it's the brain of the enteric nervous system and uh, it that your gut is where your immunity lies and if you're not going to be managing that properly if you're not keeping your gut microbiome intact then your immune response also goes down or changes so that's why it's critical that you maintain your gut health uh, properly um and a low fodmap diet helps you do that um so uh, overall like when your gut microbiome is intact or is functioning all right then your inflammatory levels go down a good resource for a, to move to a low fodmap diet is there's an app by the monash university which is very easily available although it still contains largely foods which are in the us they are updating the database every day so anyone can download it it just costs costs a few dollars and you can you know download it and use it as a ready reckoner to check whether uh, the foods that you're eating are high in fodmap or low and um, you you can uh, try that but again um the risk of moving to a low fodmap diet is that you then have to avoid a lot of uh, you know commonly eaten foods um and then you are at the risk of uh, getting another nutrition like you no know, other nutrition deficiency so if you ask me i would say consult a nutritionist who Uh, is certified in a gut health program or is certified by monash and understands uh, how to treat uh, inflammatory diseases so that while you are managing the inflammation you don't end up deficient in something uh, like iron or you know magnesium because you're not eating certain foods so, and yeah, that's uh, that's what i was coming to actually because it's not yes. very easy to monitor yourself about what to eat and what not to eat and whether you're getting the perfect nutrition which you require you know so yes. just to get something you should not get into more trouble you know so yes. just yes. Uh, be aware take a professional consultation from a uh, from a uh, you know a nutritionist and uh, see what's right for you um so that was like a good insight actually uh, so bimi uh, you were sorry yeah. you were saying that you were can you see Okay. So yeah, Amita. So that was very helpful. And in our clinical practice, we say that one size does not fit all. And okay. especially in endometriosis, each patient is different, and the management for each patient also is different. Be it surgical or diet or exercises or anything you name it. Now in diet also some uh, respond to gluten free diet, some respond to low fodmap diet and anti inflammatory diets. Now I would like to know about soy proteins. The soy is also very high in isoflavones. So, uh, what do you think it has an impact on endometriosis or not? 
so um soy but it also depends on which forms of soy you are taking um in my practice i don't advocate just switching to soy flour but uh, using like say um it's say in nutritional therapy of endometriosis is pretty much like you know wanting to maximize um each and every food that you are eating because you if you are say uh, on a gluten free or a glute, like a gfc of that gluten free casein free diet or if you are on a low carb map diet there are a lot of foods which you can't eat right so if you are then then whatever you are eating you have to ensure that you are maximizing every possible uh, nutritive aspect of that food so uh, coming to soy like say i would uh, recommend that you have say foods like tofu or tempeh which are basically made from soy but they also have probiotics in them so then you are like killing two birds with one stone so okay. um that is something which i you know like say uh, recommend to people so tempeh and tofu uh, incorporation of that definitely helps in uh, bringing because it's got phytoestrogens um so it helps in managing the symptoms but uh, a word of caution there that a um, lot of um, soy products that we see available right now they are like say not very artisanally produced uh, you know like say when they come to us they are made in really large factories and there are chances of contamination and everything so uh, when switching to or trying to get more soy into your um, food be sure of where that soy product is coming to you from so uh, other than that like say if you are not on a gluten free diet then you can always add a uh, soy flour to your atta uh, and you know use that so bring in more of the phytoestrogens but um uh, i personally feel that it's a little um overused uh, it it's it has not really shown so much effect you know as much as say a food like yam now um yam has been shown to be very healing in nature and uh, a perfect food or rather one of my favorite foods to prescribe whenever i am uh, you know working with any uh, chronic inflammation because it brings down inflammation level like nothing else the okay. yam that you get here. That's, so that's my take on soy yeah that's amazing that's actually uh, that's actually helpful because i think uh, i've read about yam but probably never took it seriously uh, the benefits of yam <laughs> i i mean i think now i think i should get into uh, you know picking up yam more often <laughs> than yeah. not yeah so you see uh, if you see like currently you you're seeing yam in every single product that is being made uh, or to uh, say have claims of anti aging for women now what is aging it's again inflammation you know like say it's like a, it's a product of inflammation levels you know changing in your body and yam has been shown uh, to have a beneficial effect yam chickpeas moringa um kale broccoli all of these foods you know have been shown to be healing in nature and hence uh, like i always i literally tell every patient of mine to have like say a yam stir fry at 5 pm every single day you know that's how much i you know i have seen the efficacy of yam so that's like a miracle food <laughs> it is it is great endometriosis yeah. is a estrogen dependent disease and yes. so i probably do produce a lot of estrogen yes so, yes so the patient don't tolerate it well And, yes. So, uh, like I said, you know, like one wouldn't recommend just moving to say a soy flour, but uh, like soy also brings in uh, that that whole uh, correlation is not uh, you know like say really uh, well established. Some studies have shown to have a beneficial effect, and some have to, shown to have an adverse effect. But um, if you want to have soy, then have it as a probiotic in as a tempeh or tofu is what I would say. Yes. And I would also like to mention here that. uh this session is uh like what we say uh, it's a uh, management part of the management it is not the treatment of endometriosis at all it's not a substitute for any surgery it is just a symptomatic management and usually post surgery the excision surgeries we do that is also just a part of the management we do the surgery and we put the patients on anti inflammatory diet post surgery so uh, without surgery diet is not going to help any of you surgery is the the treatment i would say for endometriosis it has to be done for the symptomatic relief and for enhancing fertility and to save all the other organs so this is a part of the management most of the cases post surgery 
or if you are waiting for the surgery you can put yourself on anti inflammatory diet or the diet which suits you it is we are not discussing about a substitute for endometriosis treatment oh, okay. it is internal like you do exercises like you do breathing exercises is just general treatments we are discussing and surgery remains the mainstay of endometriosis laparoscopic excision is the gold standard and post surgery definitely this goes a long way if we change the lifestyle if we change the diet if we do pelvic exercises we can delay the recurrence of endometriosis definitely absolutely absolutely food does play a major role post your surgery i think uh, food is one of the most important thing that you will have to you know take under consideration because endometriosis is a, re is a recurrent disease so if you keep having inflammation in your body endometriosis is yeah that is something which will come back so this is something which you have to take care of surgery is the mainstream treatment there is no option uh amita another thing uh, which is again very confusing i know it's not very easy for you also to answer because you know you can't pinpoint nuts nuts are again you know there are so many nuts which are available what's good what's not i know it completely depends on individual to individual but oh in case in case you can give us a broad picture of how things work sure so um before like say like this is not a uh, like dr vimi is also saying that uh, please treat this as a as an awareness thing because uh, like not everything is going to suit everyone um when patients come in we uh, send them to uh, you know get a comprehensive uh, food tolerance test done based on which we decide as in whether uh, some like you know some people are sensitive to peanuts others are not some are sensitive to almonds others are not so uh, based on that we decide as to uh, what food or what nuts in particular they can be having but um, overall it is uh, like say inclusion of walnuts in your diet is something because it comes with a, a, a good uh, mufa and the entire fatty acid profile um so um, that is something which is recommended even almonds they suit some uh, they don't others uh, for others but almonds are also good um peanuts may or may not suit everyone um so that uh, also needs to be checked again that whether you are sensitive to peanuts or not uh but an uh, healthy inclusion of say at least a tiny fistful of nuts in everyone's diet is recommended because uh, like it brings you a good protein fiber it's also prebiotic in nature hence works on bringing the inflammation down that's that's right uh, so the main uh, the main thing that uh, we actually see here is food sensitivity i i mean people would have to get their sensitivity uh, test done make a, what i would rec what i generally recommend my uh, my friends or what i have done for myself is making a food journal where you actually include what suits you what suiting you how you feel after eating a certain food yeah. and what is not suiting you so it's it's a principle yeah. of exclusion you know so you keep excluding Absolutely. whatever is not suiting you you know but uh, so uh, what you yeah. are uh, mentioning is called the elimination diet which is what yes. we uh, you know like say recommend for patients who after they come to us after we see because a lot of times uh, you know you I, for example i i got a food tolerance test, test done today my sensitivities may change after 5 years so it's not Correct. like you know i did it once and now i'm sorted for life um especially if you have endometriosis or you are sensitive to foods uh, then you it becomes imperative that you do these food tolerance tests at certain different points of time in life so that you know that you know like say for example i myself was never um, allergic to mushrooms but now i am sensitive to mushrooms so this you know changes with uh, time and you know like say as you're growing older and your body is changing um and again like what you were mentioning is like maintaining a food journal and then going on an elimination diet under supervision is what one would uh, like as a nutritionist i would recommend uh, so that you're not a, you're not missing out on any uh, nutrients and plus you are able to uh, clearly identify like say for example if um peanuts are not working for me then your nutritionist can tell you that whatever nutrients you're getting from your peanut where else can you get them from so that you know it's all balanced makes sense makes sense okay. um that's right so so we me uh, there was something that we were talking about i think we've covered it earlier but i think uh, 
<laughs> this is a question that yeah. you need to ask. One of my favorite comes in this, <laughs> so I'll not ask. I think caffeine and alcohol we have already discussed. But caffeine, uh, I wanted to check. Uh, alcohol, I know completely it is a trigger. But caffeine in all ways, because I, I have. I was like a big coffee person, <laughs> and I have completely stopped it. You know, I mean, I've not completely stopped, cut down quite a bit. So I wanted to check. I mean, this is a personal question. So that no, coffee is working definitely. Uh, they have a <laughs> with this uh, inflammation. So what about caffeine? Get relief okay. when they ca caffeine, and. Sorry. Some people do get relief uh, from. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was saying, alcohol and smoking definitely is a no-no because of inflammation and all that. But caffeine, yes, as Shilpa said, some people do get relief when they take caffeine. So how does it help, and what should be done for this, Amita? So, um, like I said, one needs to see whether uh, you know, like, say, what are your triggers. Um, everyone has a different reaction to every food that they are taking in. Um, now, caffeine is again an ergogenic. It also, uh, you know, like say, improves your metabolism, right? A, a coffee and caffeine. Um, so, for example, if you have to have caffeine just a little bit and it's not really uh, impacting or you're following everything else in the book, you know, are you doing everything else in terms of your exercise and your, you know, not having alcohol, sleeping right, stress management, if everything else is done, then uh, say about 50 ml of caffeine is okay you know like say if it's not if you're not um, getting any um, say adverse effects from it immediately but um, i would recommend that you have it before you know use it as an ergogenic because caffeine brings in a boost in your metabolic levels and that combined with exercise then gives you a different result altogether in managing uh, you know like say your inflammation or in managing your health and metabolism overall so, uh, Dr. Shilpa, if you really have to have your caffeine, then have it before your workout. Oh, that, uh, that's, uh, that's a good suggestion. I think um, with endometriosis, with the hormone medication comes the weight. That is another yes. thing. So, uh, yes. I think uh, I'll have a cup of coffee before I exercise. That will take care of my yes. weight. Also. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure. That will also ensure that you don't miss out your exercise. Uh, exercise, um, Amita, honestly speaking, I was never an exercise person earlier. But mm -hmm. uh, since the time I have had my endometriosis come in and depression because of the medication that I was taking, I think exercise has become like a big part of my life. Because uh, when I exercise, uh, obviously the endorphins that are produced do make me happy, at least Absolutely. for some time, you know. So that gives me that happiness so that's what i realized when nothing was helping exercise was something which was helping me so now it's like become ingrained so now it's like i have to do it if not a proper exercise even if i dance for 45 minutes i think that's more than enough <laughs> you know that is definitely it's cardio at the end of the day but yeah. let's say some um so what we always recommend is that don't look at say workout as a workout or something right. that you're going to do just going to the gym find something that you enjoy that you can do consistently for life you know like say if you enjoy dancing then dance your way to your health if you enjoy walking or running then do that i mean um obviously like say if you are super lean uh, but have endometriosis as well <clears throat> then you know like say you might have to do some weight training and everything but right. mostly with endometriosis you see an associated weight gain so um you know like say working out or doing cardio uh, workouts or doing just body weight training uh, definitely helps you in keeping yourself healthy because it's keeps a check on all the hormones and in the way uh, you know like say your body is handling all the hormones and plus the endorphins uh, keep your you know you keep you going like happier through the entire day and the the metabolic effect of workout it does, is never limited only till that 40 minutes that you work out it definitely is proven like you know in every studies that it lasts you through the day so get exercise i, I, I think your go-to is running if i'm not wrong oh yes it is <laughs> i i know i know um so um a lot of people a lot of women with endometriosis 
uh, do have a lot of problem with constipation. Constipation is one of the major issues that comes with endometriosis. So from what I've read, uh, soluble fiber is important to keep the food moving down your bowel smoothly and helping the body to naturally expel excess hormones instead of reabsorbing it continuously, recycling in the body. So what exactly is soluble fiber and in which food can we find them? So um, all plant-based foods are going to have fiber. Okay, there are two kinds. You have soluble and insoluble. Insoluble fibers are uh, stuff which are not at all, like say, uh, broken down or don't even absorb like much water in your body. And they're just um, like go go out of your bowel. And soluble fibers are stuff which, like literally to put it simply, interact with what is there in your you know like say in your system now uh, what soluble fiber also does is that um it removes the excess uh you know like say the estrogen that you have in body so um the what liver does is uh, in managing your estrogen levels it tags um estrogen and sends it to, to be emptied out and uh, so the soluble fiber then picks like you know interacts with this and picks at its uh picks the uh, 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 estrogen which needs to be removed out of the body and uh, like you know it gets excreted um now uh, i mean like this also has like say a gut health component is that if your uh, gut microbiome if is not balanced or if you have imbalances in say in your digestion then um, the bacteria in your gut um, the bad bacteria what they can do is the uh, estrogen that was tagged by the liver to be eliminated and carried with the fiber gets untagged and hence remains in the system circulating again. So uh, this is another reason why, you know, like say it's important to be managing your gut health, including um, say foods which are rich in, uh, like say so, uh, any any dietary fiber, soluble or insoluble. So any, all your food, whole foods, uh, whole fruits, vegetables are, uh, you know, even millets are um, good sources of uh, soluble fiber. And plus drinking a lot of water. Um, some people also use psyllium husk therapies wherein you uh, you know like say give uh, psyllium husk as a supplement to increase the soluble fiber in your body to get rid of um, the uh, you know constipation issues uh, but what people miss in that is like while they're taking psyllium husk they don't uh, bring up the uh, hydration levels or the water levels so then what if you're not drinking enough water with the psyllium husk you're actually going to get even more constipated so while you're bringing your fiber levels up uh, you also need to be drinking enough water and that is how you manage uh, your constipation and plus exercise a healthy movement throughout the day um you like not necessarily you know like say just a 40 minute workout but uh, you know trying to get ten thousand steps um uh, covered in a day or you know taking the stairs or doing some push-ups or squats or riding a bike or all of that exercise also helps in managing constipation. Perfect. So um, that's coming. Yeah. So Vimi, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. So I wanted to mention about a study which was recently published in Human Reproduction, uh, where they observed the inverse association between higher food consumption and laparoscopically confirmed endometriosis. Okay. So they found an association with the citrus fruits. Mm -hmm. Like patients who had endometriosis, when they retrospectively, uh, their questionnaire, questionnaire was given to them, they found out that mm -hmm. they were not taking citrus fruits. Okay. okay. And uh, another group, they found that intake of cruciferous vegetables, corn and peas, beans was associated was with an increased risk of endometriosis yes okay so yeah so uh yeah you were saying something amita you yeah to... so um the cruciferous vegetables corns and peas these are high fodmap foods so they are bound to you know like say increase your inflammatory levels and um citrus fruits they are vitamin c is something which brings down your inflammatory levels it has antioxidants and hence fights the free radicals that are present in your body pretty much like vitamin a vitamin k um and also uh, you know like say the follets and that is why it's important that you have like uh include a good amount of uh, you know like say uh, fruits and vegetables and legumes in your diet but again, if you're on a, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, see. 
yeah and but again like while i'm saying legumes uh, if you're trying to avoid uh, the pod maps then you will have to let's say you know cut back on them or find other sources for your uh, proteins so fresh fruits especially citrus fruits should be uh, an important part of your diet yes and um, uh, i would not recommend juicing fruits because then you know like say you miss out on some uh, fiber but if at all uh, you are in such a rush in life that you can't you don't have time to eat like say a bowl of fruit then uh, try and use like say a cold press juicer and hence have some soluble fiber in it but uh, eat your fruits and vegetables absolutely so uh, are there any supplements which uh, are helpful in patients with endometriosis amita yes um a lot of times you see iron deficiencies so uh, deficiency in iron has been also correlated with uh, you know like say greater inflammatory levels or it's it's one of the fallout of the a uh, chronic inflammation that you see so iron supplements again after having checked all your uh, blood uh, reports and you know, like say all the uh, levels is what one uh, just excuse me one minute is are you able to see hear some sound yes. here no right no that's fine okay. a little disturbance okay. but it's fine yeah i was <laughs> getting that crazy notification i don't know so anyway i was saying uh, no uh the iron levels uh, iron supplementation is recommended also calcium magnesium and zinc you know like say um is uh, uh, recommended uh, because uh, those levels have been like magnesium and zinc specifically have been shown to be beneficial in uh, say improving or reducing uh, you know like say the symptoms because it works pretty much hand in hand in pain management and um, also um, vitamin k and k2 d3 k2 so basically all the primary um, vitamins which are uh, antioxidant in nature um, need to be managed and uh, you know like say uh, supplements for those are recommended um what is also uh, useful is uh, you know like say some herbs um so um there are obviously a lot of studies going on uh, you know like say in the like say herbal therapies of uh, you know like say used for endometriosis or inflammatory diseases but um, things like uh, turmeric or even um, ginger licorice uh, are have been known uh, to have a uh, cinnamon to have uh, you know like say bring down your inflammatory levels so um it is taken as a you know like say in the form of a tea or something um it again depends on uh, you know like say on your nutritionist uh, one i wouldn't uh, you know like say recommend people to just start taking 3 teaspoons of turmeric a day to bring down inflammatory levels because that can again cause you constipation but uh, you know like say these herbs have also been um, shown to be uh, effective and um, another very interesting study that i came across the other day um there's this um, a plant called lady's mantle now lady's mantle has been uh, you know like say used um, in uh, treating a lot of uh, pains um, and uh, issues associated with women's reproductive system and their uh, you know, like say periods so um that is now also available as a tea uh, although one has to be very cautious of uh, what how much of uh, the lady's mantle you're taking and it has to be prescribed by someone like say who's a certified herbalist or a nutritionist who knows you know what they are giving you but uh, there are like many other approaches also coming up uh, even in diet therapy for um, addressing endometriosis absolutely um uh, saying that i think uh, I, we have covered it magnesium is like a major major supplement which i think we, anyone with endometriosis or anyone who has had anyone like me who's had a hysterectomy a total hysterectomy you know the estrogen completely drops and your sleep cycle goes for a toss so magnesium also helps in your sleep so sleeping yeah. that is something yeah so that is something which you will have to uh, you know consider so yeah. i think this has been like uh, uh, an amazing session by far yeah and uh, so the um, point, yes. just just if i may add because we didn't mention it um probiotic supplements are also recommended so uh, you know it's been because uh, you're talking about sleep now uh, sleep gets impacted if your digestion is not okay and then it in turn increases your stress levels and it in increases your inflammatory levels so um uh, one would always recommend a probiotic uh, for anyone having uh, inflammatory diseases because uh, the thing with the gut microbiome is that you have good bacteria and bad bacteria 
but the good bacteria is pretty much like a busy tourist you know they come they see they work and they leave so you have to ensure that you know you are constantly supplying um, the good bacteria in like you know in your you're taking it in uh, through your diet every day uh, because your body can't uh, kind of store them somewhere or they can't you know produce it in your body and these good bacteria again they also help you in the metabolism and uh, production of a lot of uh, say b complex vitamins so that is another reason why they're important so uh, probiotic supplements is something which is also recommended you know but again depends on um which where you are in your digestive issues and what say what is your uh, nutritional line of therapy along with the uh, surgical or medical interventions so, true true yeah. so as i was just reading today in in ayurveda it is said that a person having a problematic gut has problems everywhere in the body so oh, yeah. guys take That's care true. of your gut that is yeah, like if, uh, if your gut ain't happy ain't nobody happy <laughs> absolutely absolutely so the point is not to completely stop every food that's called inflammatory food but to minimize them as much as possible absolutely. have good good food and bad food in a ratio of 80 is to 20 so anti inflammatory diet is the one that will help you feel energized and healthy for a long term it was one of the most amazing sessions we had very very informative amita i'm like really really thankful to you this has been like a very informative one vimi thank you so much again for being with us and it's thank like you, and thank you so much it was really informative thank you so and much it was a pleasure there are some comments i would like to yeah. mention here uh Stacy has mentioned oh yes by all means tell me how just staying away from inflammatory food will unfreeze my pelvis unstick my uterus from colon and stop all of my sciatic pain Stacy we have already mentioned in the session that this is just a part of the uh, change in lifestyle and diet habits surgery is the treatment you have to undergo a uh, excision surgery then only you will get relief from all your symptoms and post surgery you can stick to your anti inflammatory diet or whichever diet suits you absolutely the one is <coughs> aarti has mentioned very informative thank you amita ji and how often should you take pre and probiotics to help the gut movement and constipation okay so uh, prebiotics are um, all the like foods uh, fruits and vegetables and you know whole grains that you're taking but the probiotics are something which you have to take daily um so uh, it again there are different uh, kinds of probiotics and digestive enzymes available uh, i don't know where she is located so i won't be able to tell the brand and you know like say a supplement but a general uh, probiotic having say a combination of five different uh, type of bacteria plus some digestive enzymes is recommended to be taken every day but uh, again for your constipation you definitely have to work only on your fiber intake and uh, you know like say improve your soluble fiber intake exercise and drink lots of water she has also asked how important is alkali alkalizing your body okay now that is a different concept altogether but um like say uh, if you look at the um, endometrial endometriosis diet or an anti inflammatory diet it is uh, pretty much alkaline alkaline in nature because foods which make your diet, make your body more acidic are the ones which are like dairy products um, highly processed foods or you know red meats and uh, rich meats and everything so uh, following an anti inflammatory diet like the one that we discussed uh, or the past one are almost is uh, again an alkaline diet in nature so it was the same way perfect is there anything else with me mm, no she has also mentioned that curcumin and licorice root helps help her and uh, because she is an endometriosis patient so she has uh, mentioned her experience that uh, she had eight surgeries and went dairy free and gluten free diet and she is a vegetarian for last 7 years but she can eat cheese and chocolate as she doesn't react to it so it <laughs> yeah. depends on how your body is reacting to these foods but this also is not only the, about chronic illness because if you have food allergies then that is a separate role it plays so very important mm -hmm. to rule out the food allergies which, which i think amita Absolutely. has already mentioned and explained in detail how we can switch over to elimination diet and check for the allergies 
and uh, mm. one size does not fit all again i am mentioning absolutely. that absolutely absolutely it doesn't it's uh, everything is very unique because we are all such complex bodies and everyone is different we come with a different gene set lifestyle the environment foods that we eat yeah, many, so you many have times, to yeah. many times patients ask me uh, why you are referring to the dietitian why can't you give me a diet chart so i do <laughs> tell them that you have a customized diet chart she Adia, will tell you absolutely Exactly. Find out preferences. She will uh, uh, palpate all those things and yeah. liking, dislikes, and what suits you. Then she will design Absolutely. a right chart. And uh, sometimes I don't understand. Then I have to tell them that this is how it works. It does not that what you like, I'll also like, and I can start eating it. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. So a proper trained nutritionist uh, can guide us and uh, help our patients uh, reducing their inflammation and symptoms and Mm. it it really helps in the long run we okay. are what we eat i yeah. exactly and i need to take professional help professional yeah. help is required there is no substitute to a professional help no, so we, we can't give the diet chart so uh, all the patients do ask us actually when i refer them <laughs> doctor aap hi likh ke de dijiye like this is what this is that the common thing actually yeah. uh, so that that you have to take and uh, it will be unique for you hmm. correct correct that's right so right. amazing so it's been like a lovely session i would like uh, th- uh, amita thank you so much once again vimi thanks and i and i would like to thank all the audience who were there watching our uh, facebook live now and whoever will join in and watch our mm-hmm. recording thank you so much for supporting us in increasing this thank awareness you. thank you and have a lovely thank weekend you. bye bye yes, good night thank you thank you shilpa thank you mita